Thursdays, you guys already know what it is. We're back for another Q&A. Let's just get into this. Tune in tomorrow. I'm going to be making my official UFC 284 prediction. I already have a video breaking down Islam and Volkanovski. If you guys want to go check that out. So let's start the Q&A. I assume there's going to be a lot of questions about UFC 284. So let's let's get into it. I answered a little bit less questions this time because, you know, as you guys know, I am sick, but I still wanted to be able to do a Q&A. Normally I answer about 20 questions. This time I answered about like 10 to 12 or so. In what fight Connor did well in striking against Dustin? The second, maybe. A little because Dustin... Dustin had a ruthless game plan. But the third fight, Dustin improved out of the both of them, and he was out timing and out striking Connor. It wasn't even. Connor can do well against Dustin in a fourth fight, but I'm betting on Dustin for outclassing him in all aspects, especially in striking and competitive stamina and trash talk. So I assume this question comes from me saying something like that Connor outstruck Dustin or that he had some success on the feet, which is something that I do agree with. I don't think that he obviously outstruck him because, you know, he lost both fights. But obviously, we're not talking about the first fight, we're talking about the other two. And the first fight, you cannot argue. I mean, in the first round, I think Connor won that first round. He rocked Dustin. He had a lot of moments with the boxing. Now, if you watch any of my videos, you guys will see that I always say, hey, Dustin's the best boxer in the UFC. And this is because I always list he outboxed Connor. And especially in that second fight, beautifully outboxed and moved his head perfectly. It was really well trained for that fight. I think Connor gets disrespected in that conversation. I mean, look at the fight with Floyd Mayweather. But I'm getting off topic here. And I think in the second fight, early on, I think he was winning the stand up. And by early on, I mean like the first minute and a half or so. You know, you see Connor mixing up his strikes like he used to. He even landed the left hand, I'm pretty sure, in the first 10 seconds. Now, I'm not at all trying to suggest that if Connor broke his leg, that he would have won that fight. But to say that Connor had no moments on the feet, and I think even you're agreeing that would just be ridiculous. He definitely had moments on the feet. All right, next question. Sean asks, what is your view of PEDs in sport? You big up John Jones, but he is a known PED user, and his record would look a lot differently with no PEDs. I think people underestimate how much PEDs can affect the outcome of fights. Do you think PEDs are an issue beyond those who get caught. 1000% it's an issue. I actually one time for a college class, one time I made a whole presentation about steroid use in sports and it had to do like a lot of research on it. And yeah, like this thing is very serious and truth be told, there's a lot of mysteries when it comes to it. There's people who think that there's a kind of like underground steroids that people aren't even testing for. It's obviously a very serious issue. And you know, to respond to the John Jones thing, I think that John Jones is the greatest of all time. You know, if you want to tell me, hey, I don't think he's the greatest of all time because of PED use, I totally understand that. Then okay, yeah, George St. Pierre is probably the greatest of all time. But the thing is, the reason I don't really count it so much is because you can't really be sure who's on PED and who's not. Yes, Anderson and John Jones has gotten caught, but who's to say GSP wasn't on it? Who's to say Habib or Islam aren't on it? I mean, there's a picture of Islam when he's like 16 or something that looks absolutely crazy. And look, I'm not going to make any accusations here because I'm not an expert. But all I'm trying to say is, like, I think a lot of people are suspect. You know, even we see Conor McGregor looking like he's on steroids nowadays. Well, pretty much confirmed that he's on steroids at least. But yeah, it's definitely a huge problem, is what I'm trying to say. Mean Canal asks, what are your favorite books? A little bit odd for an MMA channel, but you know, like I say, ask anything and we're going to go at it right now. Now, I'd be lying if I said I was an avid reader. You know, I'm not the type of guy that just sits down on the couch, you know, opens a nice book and relaxes. Honestly, I usually dedicate my free time to either this, school, or just going out. Probably less school. But I don't want to say, like, oh, it's my favorite book, because I feel like maybe this is, like, a little too odd to be, like, a someone's favorite book. But in high school specifically, I used to read the Game of Thrones books. Literally, like, that's literally the only book I can remember being, like, oh, yeah, like, literally sitting down and chilling reading a book. I mean, obviously, I've read, like, other books, you know, for school and things like that, but I'm not the type of guy to be sitting down doing that. I also like Ben Askren's uh, biography, but if you're not an avid reader like me, you guys can go click the Audible link in the description, use my code, and help support the channel. All right, Jordan Bolton says, cool upload, feel better. Well, first of all, thank you. You know, as you guys know, I've been sick. got diagnosed with the flu. I'm slowly dying. So here's the question. What do you think it would take for Bellator or PFL to really change UFC as a top MMA promotion? So obviously, look, I think a lot of you guys already kind of disagree with me. We've already had arguments in the comments, people saying my opinions are terrible. A lot of people saying one is the second best. I think in terms of like marketing value and what's popular, at least in America, like I know one is popular overseas, but I think the PFL is honestly the one that is going to seriously challenge UFC. The only thing I'm worried about the PFL is like, I don't know how they're getting this money. They're spending a lot of money and I'm not trying to say that they're running out of business at the moment, but I really wouldn't be surprised if we're here in like five years or so that they're running out of business. But to me, what makes a good MMA organization is simplicity and stakes, right? Which is what the PFL has and what the UFC obviously has. PFL is pretty simple to follow. Hey, we're doing this tournament. At the end of the year, we're going to have this big finale and the winner gets a million dollars, right? Easy, easy stakes. But Bellator just doesn't really have that. I mean, yes, Bellator has rankings, but it's just kind of like, who's paying attention to that? I mean, I think obviously there's some big fighters in Bellator, you know, Corey Anderson, who was a UFC fighter, but like AJ McKee. I think if the PFL manages not to lose money and keeps at the trajectory that they're going at, like they already have pretty 
pretty good names like Brendan Logname, and now they have Jake Paul connected to this. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the PFL takes off in a few years. Now, in my opinion, I don't think anything is going to beat the UFC, at least in the next 10 years or so, unless the UFC seriously drops the ball somehow. But I think it's also going to take, look, a lot of fighters are looking over at the PFL and saying, you're making a million dollars by winning this tournament, and I'm fighting, like, way better fighters for less. That's really what it's going to take, is for the UFC to really lose their fighters. But I think before they do that, I think they'll have to, like, step up the pay or something like that. I don't think they're going to let that happen. All right, Type of Goat asks, who do you think would be a tougher matchup for Alex if he loses to Islam that goes back to 145 to defend the featherweight belt against Yair or M? So, look, regardless if he wins or loses on Saturday, he's going back to 145 to defend the belt. Who do I think is a tougher matchup? This might be an unpopular opinion, but I'm going with Josh Emmett. Reason being because I was watching Alexander Volkanovsky's fights, you know, preparing for my prediction, and the chat meant this fight really caught my attention because he really struggled in that fight. Yes, he got the finish, but there were a lot of moments where he got struggled. He got dropped. He got taken down. It wasn't all perfect for Alexander Volkanovsky, and you know, Chad Mendes wasn't like a prime Chad Mendes either. I think Josh Emmett's going to present some problems because I think Alexander Volkanovsky prefers fighting taller fighters, and Josh Emmett kind of reminds me of a Chad Mendes type style, but younger. So honestly, I'm going to go Josh Emmett, and I might place some money, some underdog money on Josh Emmett, not saying I think he's going to win, but now next one is a comment under my video about Volk winning. It's basically arguing every single one of my points, so I'm going to be breaking down and responding to this comment. All right, this is from GG Boy. You say Volk will win because Islam has worse cardio by pointing out Khabib has gassed out before. How does that make any sense? How does another completely fighter's past performance say anything about Islam's cardio? So first thing about that is I was only trying to compare styles. I also compared Islam to Hamza. Like it was only a comparison. Same way that I would compare, you know, maybe another jujitsu guy getting tired to Charles Oliveira. I'm not saying that this is a done deal. And honestly, that wasn't even my prediction. I was just naming some arguments similar how I did with the Islam video. You say vocal win because he's hard to finish. The judging criteria doesn't award defensive fighters. So how exactly would this be an edge for Volk. Also, Volk is hard to finish against featherweights. Volk actually gets finished in heavier weight class, and guess what? This fight is gonna happen at a heavier weight class. Someone's a little mad. Well, first of all, I think I made it pretty clear. You know, Alexander Volkanovsky being hard to finish was part of the game plan, is what I said. I said, hey, let Islam or anybody, I'm not just saying specifically Islam, but a wrestler gas out, maybe trying to get some ground and pound, trying to get some submission attempts. Let them tire out their arms and survive in the later rounds and hopefully get the knockout. That's what I was trying to say. I wasn't saying that the judging obviously ordered that there would be a decision win for Volkanovski. I even said literally that Islam could win the first two rounds and the last three rounds could go to Volk because he's tired. Secondly, also, you forget to mention that Volk's loss was at welterweight, not 155, which obviously I assume you know because you specifically said a heavier weight class instead of 155. But 170 to 155 is a big difference, and especially when Volk was, first of all, just starting out, and secondly, didn't really bulk up. Lastly, you say Volk will win because he's shorter, albeit not as short as Volk. Five out of 11 of Islam's last victories were against shorter opponents. Yeah, but when you look at, like, the actual height, like, none of them match 5'6", as you just said. So, like I said, you know, I'm not saying that just shorter fighters, period, because I'm pretty sure Charles Oliveira was shorter than Islam Akachev, but 5'6 is a huge difference, and honestly, Alexander Volkanovski might be a little shorter than 5'6", if we're being honest. And hey, you know, this is, like I said, if you disagree, that's fine. Leave in the comment section below. I always want to know. I'm always going to be here to hear the opposite opinion. Jordan Bolton asks, what do you think is or should be the biggest factor for determining the pound-for-pound -pound best fight? Well, in my opinion, I just think it's like who's doing the most right now. Like, I don't necessarily put it as like a who would win against who because it's really impossible to do that because styles make fights. MMA math doesn't work. Just because Islam beats Volk doesn't mean Volk beats Kamaru Usman pound for pound, right? Or just because Islam beats Volk doesn't mean he beats Adesanya pound for pound. There's a lot of things to consider. And that's why I think Kamaru Usman was pound for pound back in August. And that's why I really don't think Islam or Volk should really be pound for pound number one, in my opinion. I think it should be John Jones. Like, explain to me how John Jones is on the pound for pound rankings but not number one that is just impossible i don't care that he hasn't fought for two years and take him off the list but if he's on the list then he's number one but if he's not on the list then then okay fine all right nicholas asks are you going to release a bill simmons type pantheon list for mma i have a pretty clear top four john jones gsp silva and dj but i think it's arguable after that so if enough people ask for that type of list i would totally be down just leave it in the comment section below but i totally agree top four in my opinion i have exactly what you have john jones anderson silva gsp underdog asked, did you check out the YouTube channel Mohead Fadashuchu? And who do you think will win between Connor or Chandler? Should the winner fight for the 170 or 155 title? Yeah, uh, this is my biggest problem with the Chandler and McGregor fight. I mean, look, we should just be having McGregor as returning, but I think it should be at 155. This fight makes no sense at 170. Like, there's no stake. Chandler's not even a 170 year. Yes, I understand Connor could still fight for the 155 pound title because he's Connor. Or he could fight for the 170 pound title because he's Connor. But I doubt the winner of this would fight for the 170 pound title. And especially if Volk wins, I really want to see Volk versus Connor because 
Volk has beaten every single featherweight champion except for Connor, so that'd be an interesting matchup for him and his legacy. I'm hoping that the fight takes place at 155. I've been hearing 170, but oh yeah, but to answer your first question, yes, I did check him out. I think I talked about this before, but yes, of course, I love that channel. I don't know how to pronounce the name at all, but of course, I know it. I watch it all the time. Hilarious. What do you think is next for Oliveira if he loses to Benil Dariush? I mean, it's kind of hard to come back from that. I mean, if you lose from Benil, not saying, obviously, Benil is legit. Like, I'm not trying to say Benil sucks, but losing to Islam and Benil, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm just hoping that Charles is done. I wouldn't mind seeing an Islam Charles rematch, in my opinion. Yes, I am a fan of Charles, so maybe I'm showing some bias here. I think if Volkanovski wins, it's not that hard to come back. Maybe he fights Faziv, maybe he gets that win. Maybe he fights another one of the guys coming up, gets a few wins, and gets a title shot. But if Islam's a champ, yeah, I have no idea what's next for him. Maybe he fights at 170, maybe he fights Connor. I don't know. But what I think should be next is fun fights. Like, let's just get him some cool fights. Some like Nate Diaz type fights. You don't need Diaz in the UFC anymore, but just type of fights like that. Just some fights like that. Maybe Robbie Lawler, Santiago Ponsonibio, something like that. Maybe RDA. I don't think they fought before. Do you think Islam Makachev versus Hamzat Chemaev is competitive? My friend and I were talking about it, and I thought Hamzat would be too big for him. I'd like to hear your opinion. So if you were to make this fight, it would have to be at 170, right? Because Islam could probably make 170. Islam's probably like a natural 170 year. He looks really big for lightweight, so I don't think that'll be a problem for him. And Hamzat is a huge 170 pounder. I mean, remember what he weighed in? Eight pounds over against Nate Diaz. I mean, how could you forget that? I don't know why I said remember. I think Hamza has a power advantage. I don't think Islam would be able to take him down. I think Hamza wins by knockout. And that is going to conclude this Q&A. It was a little shorter than usual, but Q&A. Tune in next week. Every Thursday, we do Q&As. Comment questions below. But just a reminder, it is going to be after UFC 284. So if you're asking any prediction questions, don't ask that because it'll already have happened, obviously. But leave it in the comment section below or comment on any of my videos. Please subscribe. The notification bell. And I'll see you guys in the next one.